Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, it appears that COVID has certainly changed the way we view work and our work environment expectations. We're well, joining me in a conversation of the future of the post-pandemic workplace is Dr. Eli Jamison. She's Associate Professor of Practice in the Department of Management and the Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Tech. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, it, it, it certainly seems to be a lot of tensions we're seeing right now between the workplace telework and what does that mean? And, and certainly struck by the notion that it certainly seems people want some flexibility. Corporations were saying, okay, come back. Some of them now are saying, okay, some telework may be okay and what have you. But there seems to be some real tension and negotiation in that arena alone, even locally. Yeah, I think we're seeing all of this impact us wherever we are. Um, I mean, the global studies on this are, are very similar to what we see na nationally and, then, uh, and locally. I mean, I, I think it's important to probably bear in mind that there are a certain percent of our, of our jobs that just can't ever be remote, right? So some of this is um, certainly an important conversation around what happens, but I've seen estimates from 40 to 60 percent of jobs simply can't be remote because of the very nature of what they do, at least not right now. The technology doesn't support it. Um, but yeah, it's a real tension that we're seeing. Um, you know, I, I teach college students much like you have and their demands coming out increasingly are all over the place. Many of them want some portion virtual. Many of some want to be in person after having been in COVID for so long. Um, but we are seeing an increased pressure on employers to accommodate the need for hybrid or fully virtual workplaces. And we're going to explore some of those unique characteristics as, as it relates to that. Some of the corporations, it seems like they're saying, okay, um, three days a week, two days a week, at least some of, uh, of that. But it doesn't seem that all or none is going to work anymore. I think it, that in terms of much of the workforce, there is that expectation, even across generations, in terms of flexibility in terms of the work environment. Yeah, it is interesting, and I think you've said an important thing there. What we're learning from the research that are coming out, and it's emerging as we speak, right? I mean, <laughs> it's changed in the time since we started talking about having this conversation, is that different generations want different things. It seems to be split by gender. It, there seems to be different pressures by, uh, by different kinds of demographic characteristics. It, it's a really complicated soup for employers right now. Uh, by and large, you know, interestingly, right now when we talk about return to the workplace, I just was reading this morning that it's still the youngest generation at almost 60% who are still most worried about returning to the workplace because of exposure to COVID. It goes down by age, which I find fascinating. It is. Right? That is. That so. is. Well, some of the advantages of teleworking. I mean, it, it, it obviously such things as flexible schedule, but you have more time with family. In terms of women, it might help in the issue of childcare, which has really come in a great deal of focus. Um, and some even put it as trivial as, well, I don't have to dress for work. I can work in my pajamas, which is a kind of an interesting notion. <laughs> so there's certain advantages that people see now in terms of that. Um, the polls I have seen that it, and you just suggested that, that, it, that women seem to prefer more the flexibility than men. And that's an in interesting difference between men and women. Yeah, it's an interesting, we know that um, a disproportionate amount of work for the home still falls on women, right? So some of this is unexpected in terms of work-life balance, although men are feeling that pressure as well. Um, disproportionately, women are responding to that. I would say though, and this is, I just, again, came out August 10th, a new study, and it's purported to be the first comprehensive study of work-life balance and the impact on virtual work and careers came out of George Washington, it's showing up in the Academy of Management Journal, says that it's a mixed bag for women in terms of careers. That uh, for some women, virtual work is great benefit to their careers for lots of personal and professional reasons. 
but maybe equally as many reasons detrimentally. For example, some women don't even accept virtual work in their career, according to this study, because they're afraid it's gonna make them appear that they are not career-minded, that they are unwilling to go to work, because we are, women still disproportionately are typecast as, well, you're the mom, <laughs> right? And therefore, we can't X, Y, or Z. Uh, so the fear of that is preemptively causing women to make decisions about their careers potentially, according to this new study. So it's gonna be really complicated for a while um, for all people in, in making these virtual decisions. You know, the, the flip side of this equation, the tension is 60 plus percent of employees globally say that they are more productive at work. That is when they work for, well, actually let me, that they are more productive now that they're working from home Executives, however, are not making the same claims. And they, while they say they acknowledge that productivity went up, they are not actually, they are very concerned about the sustainability of that productivity because they see certain, you know, you lose certain things. To your point about the increasing hybrid workplace is things like the collaboration potential. And what about the possibility of having those in-person meetings when you need to have them or the corporate culture? Because those, are, those structures are hard to change. And it was interesting to see some of the, the people, one of the things about the advantage is that I can avoid the work environment drama. Yeah. I don't have to put up with that necessarily. But to that latter point, um, I very much see the notion of, wow, what happens in the halls can be very important. Mentoring, it's hard to mentor if you're not there in person. Maintaining morale, and I, 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 and I know I'm, I'm speaking from a generational divide, and I acknowledge that, um, but there does seem to be some downfalls to teleworking uh, itself. Well, I think, I mean, I do think it's important for us to keep in perspective broadly that, I mean, this is a conversation that's been going on for decades now. I mean, and just, you know, refreshing to have this conversation with you. I came across a 1998 headline. It, changing employee demands are changing the workforce at a radical pace. We're gonna have computers everywhere, we have paperless offices, and we're gonna have to worry about telework. I mean, that was 24 years ago. Wow. And that was that initial push. And then there was a lot of resistance. It's also, um, I think, relevant to the conversation that there are a lot of places that have been successfully tele, not the majority, but very successfully teleworking for very, very many years, for decades now. Um, the question becomes, is all work suited to that? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Are all companies and organizations suited to that? That depends on the commitment of the leadership and the invest. It's not a small undertaking to convert from in-person work to virtual work, even if your work is suited to it. And the management of that, I mean, my goodness, I mean, that, that's, the complexity of managing a hybrid workforce. Um, and I remember during the early days of the pandemic, having relate to uh, higher education, it was interesting to sit in front of Zooming for eight plus hours, which is a very different, you develop kind of a skill because you're kind of looking at yourself looking at others, but it is more complex to manage rather than I could just go down the hall what about this or check in on that? And so just the management of the hybrid work environment is a little bit more complex, I think. It's, it is more complex in that, I would say it's a radical, it, it's a pretty significant change for many people. Um, one of the things that we know is that there's this huge push towards measurement, data collection. What's productivity? It's all about productivity. How do we measure, 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 measure? And importantly, we're shifting towards measuring all jobs. I mean, we know that the Amazon warehouse worker gets measured to death, but now our doctors are measured, our executive VPs are measured by time date metrics. And I read a, an article in the New York Times just this week about a chaplain getting measured for their rate of visits, which is horrifying. <laughs> Perhaps by, by conversion, maybe a bit a, a more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could I be, what's next? Right, so managers <laughs> are feeling this push to manage by data. But then the flip side of that is, you know, when we were all in person, 
we didn't demand that kind of measurement. No. Not only that, we didn't have it, and the research is telling us, but managers believed they were managing well and their people were productive because they could see them. But that's not proof that they were productive. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. One poll I saw uh, said that of workers, 53% actually thought they were more productive. And so there doesn't, and that issue of productivity is key. Yeah. But it seems as if um, people think that it is um, uh, not as big of an issue in terms of overall. One of the things that's fascinating, and it's now called the Great Resignation mm -hmm. in 2021, 47 million Americans voluntarily quit, which was a record for the country. And of course, COVID resulted in a lot of retirements. And I guess I'll confess that uh, if I had known COVID was going to be what it was, <laughs> I, 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 I might have been among those. It was um, uh, incredibly intense for the couple of years. 20% of workers plan to quit their jobs in 2022. Certainly baby boomers are retiring. Mm -hmm. Sure. As never before. We had the millennials and the, the Zoomers or, or Generation Z uh, coming up. But uh, isn't it ironic when we have a shrinking demographic, we have jobs down to unemployment 3.6. Right. And yet there seems to be this willingness to resign from, from working. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think this is, so part of what I've been interested in for a long time is the nature of work and where do we work. And sociologists of work um, for years have been examining this. And the pandemic revealed for a lot of us, there's a lot, this is a complicated soup, but one piece of it is there's a lot of bad jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is there's a lot of work people don't find meaning in that we now had time and the support to question. Now, in some cases, you know, also the pandemic, as I think you were alluding to, and as someone who was in the same place at the same time, the pandemic just made our work really hard. <laughs> and that's certainly a source of burnout. But some of what's happening now is pulling back a shifting value set of the younger generation who are less interested in work for work's sake and more interested in work for value and well-being and um, a work life that's meaningful, right? And so it's really challenging employers to ask themselves, do I have meaningful jobs? Is everything I ask my people to do generating meaning and value? Because this generation has been has been brought up to ask those questions. I had an aha moment with a junior faculty member uh, being an administrator. And it was a pre-tenure and uh, the individual said, but now wait, I need, I need some work-life balance. I said, no, you don't, not till you get tenure. <laughs> I mean, what are you, uh, no. Yeah. Well, that was a terrible thing to say, obviously. <laughs> but it was a learning point for me right. in terms of understanding what does that mean yeah. in terms of work-life balance. And just like we're seeing now, a lot of undergraduates are telling the faculty, I need a mental health day. Mm -hmm. So the priorities for my generation is you work, you work hard and different things. And there is seem to be a real demand for more balance in terms of the millennials and certainly Generation Z. Right, and it's, and again, it's both the balance and it's what am I doing? Is what I'm doing actually adding value? Or are you just having me work to work? Um, there is just a huge <laughs> issue now about the number of meetings. You know, you and I both came from a campus environment. <laughs> There's a lot of questioning of how much and how long a meeting needs to be now to get to the work, because I don't want to confuse it. I think there's been a lot of disparagement. This young generation, um, they want to work. They're, the study after study shows they want to work, they're willing to work, but they're not willing to work for the sake of work, right? And, they, and to your earlier point, 78% of them report they want to be mentored on the job, right? Help me set the goals. We, we grew these folks up. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a parent from Generation X, so I am married to a baby boomer, so I did it too. But they grew up in an age of testing. They know how to test in short-term goal. They don't know how to set long-term goals because we never rewarded them for doing it. And employers now 
are having to work with a lot of folks about, okay, how do you get a three, six, nine month project done? Because that's what we're gonna do here. <laughs> Well, one of the stats that kind of jumped out at me, that a survey, that 44% of employees are job seekers. Well, that means almost half of the employees you have, theoretically, mm -hmm. maybe just short term, and they are looking for, quote, a greener pasture or a better deal or what have you. And that certainly changed some of the dynamics in terms of management when you look at the number that's always I'm, I'm willing to be insulted by any offer <laughs> right right I mean you, you're right I mean 40 percent the stat the stat I just saw from McKinsey was still 40 percent of job seekers are looking for re employees report that they're going to be job seeking in the next three to six months part of what this recommendation uh, from at least some of the experts out there is we are trying to recruit and retain using old old tools and we have a new situation. So what do we need to do? I mean, part of one of the recommendations is recommend that where you are in your life stage, in your career stage, in your, in your own humanness, right? Uh, your demographic, companies are going to increasingly be under demand to be prepared to offer different sort, sets of benefits towards different sets of folks if you want to address this huge cost of turnover. So. And, and, and some of those might be instead of um, a salary, providing childcare. Absolutely. I mean, things Absolutely. like that, um, that might be where you are in your work environment. Uh, parental leave a little bit more flexible. Uh, for, for men and, and Absolutely. Whatever, for parents, period, whoever uh, they are. Absolutely. Um, and I, I saw one survey that it said that in terms of the Generation Z and the younger millennials, there's a gender difference in terms of work. Males would prefer to have part-time jobs in yeah. terms of flexibility. And that, that struck me as kind of interesting. That's surprising to me. I, I don't... I mean, I'm, I'm not really familiar with that particular study, and I, I would hesitate even to guess. Um, but we do know, I would say on different, we know that fewer men are going to college. Yes. We know that that's a demographic that's shrinking, and it's problematic. We know that m men are in increasingly feeling disengaged with workplace issues. So I, I don't know if those are connected or not. Um, but I do know that only 21% of all employees globally, according to a Pew study, are actually, will say that they're engaged at work. 57% of global workers say they are both not engaged at work and not thriving. And that's a recipe for burnout. And if you have burnout, you're then gonna get quitting. Yeah. <laughs> well, so some of my acquaintances, and this tends to be in the service industries, and there were three examples, but they find an employee and excellent, does a wonderful job, but they only want to work, don't need to work 40 hours a week. I, I, I can make a living and all I need is 30 or 35. It's like when you're gonna walk away from, you, I, that's kind of an interesting. And so some will work to pay for what they need rather than the thought of I have a job that's regular in terms of this 40 hours a week. I guess there is a real national uh, push to reevaluate the 40 hour work week or five day work week. Right, well, and we know from um, global studies, right? There was a recent one, I always forget which country, but one of the Scandinavian countries, I think it was Norway recently, that just asked companies to volunteer during the pandemic for four day work week studies. And this is a repeat of a study, but they show time and time again that the measures you want in your workplace in terms of engagement and employee well-being and commitment and job, job uh, commitment and welfare all shot up. Um, and so with a four day work week. Now, it's hard to extrapolate th that to anything in the United States because they also have a different social safety net system, mm. right? So that's fun. But there is some evidence to suggest um, out there in the literature that, l that 40 hours is not a magic number. <laughs> right, right. You know, we don't know that 40 hours <laughs> gets you the most productivity. It just neatly divided by five days a week. <laughs> 
I, I was in Richmond uh, recently and, and spoke with a hospital administrator. And this administrator said that the idea of being on call, doctors, they're having some of the young doctors saying, I know I'm not gonna be on call, I will work X. I'm not gonna be on call. What they've had to do now is hire separate physicians and medical staff and technicians for the weekend or start staggering the days and so that they then would also get their days in and covering the weekends. And so it's, a, it's just interesting where employees have more power than I think they've had in a long time, you think? You have really hit, I think, the nail on the head. We're seeing for the first time a shift in balance. And I, I will say that people have been expecting this for quite some, researchers have been expecting it for quite some time, simply because as you alluded to before, the baby boomers largest generation ever, Xers, then the smallest generation since a long time with of about 34 million. Then we get to the millennials, which is the next largest generation ever. And the, bo the Zoomers, the Zs are, are coming up behind and they are also not a small demographic. So the power shift was coming. And with the retirement of Boomers, we're going to see this. Simultaneously, we're seeing an increase in union drives. Now, by no means are unions regaining the strength that they used to have but it's being driven by college educated people. And that's a radical shift in unionization. So we are seeing power changes all over. And as of someone with friends with doctors, I've heard that similar story <laughs> in terms as they hire. I mean, it's happening across profession. There is a power shift um, that's gonna be hard to resist as it's been resisted in the past. One of the things that strikes me um, is seeing so much related to mental health. Yeah. And it's not just the um, insurance that covers medical costs related to physical kinds of things and illness, but mental health. And that's another, it seems to be increasing so much uh, in the workforce. And I'm not quite sure how uh, management or corporations deal with that. I mean, that's a, now becoming another consideration, I guess. Yeah, one of the things I do in my department is I'm the coordinator of the human resource major, and and so I get a lot of HR literature. And yeah, the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and connection with mental health claims across a lot of gamuts is really, really sky, because we have a responsibility. I mean, these are considered real disabled disabling conditions that employers have to figure out how to accommodate. And we as a globe have been through a trauma, right? Everybody who survived the pandemic in some way or shape or form experienced some level of tra trauma. And we have a generation of students who are just now, who never got social emotional learning. It's only now being reincorporated in K through 12. So we're gonna have a generational crisis around emotional and mental health in the workplace for employers to figure out. You know, it, taking a snapshot right now, it, it, it concerns me that there may be an equity kind of issue. If you're in retail, food service, um, um, uh, sales and, and those kinds of things, is it only the, 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 the certain job categories which we've identified but what about those who cannot have the flexibility, who wage benefits don't seem to be able to account for or provide what some of the corporate people can do? And so I still almost say I see these trends, but there's gonna be some that are left to the side. This is a real quandary. I mean, I think now it's not just an employer quandary, it's gonna be a societal quandary. Corp corporate profits since 1970 have doubled, but they have diminished the proportion of those that go to the worker. And that's across industry. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna have a real, the equity questions of kinds of jobs, and these are important, cru crucial jobs, as we saw during the pandemic. When everything went away, we missed some things that we took for granted. Um, so yeah, we have some real, social questions to address about how we work, how do we reward the work, and what does it mean to us? What's it worth to us? Because we can't, contributing to the, the gap in our society isn't going to be good for us as a nation. So we only have a minute or so remaining. So if there was a, a kind of, as you look into the crystal ball, yeah. are there two or three 
little bullet points that you would share with us and kind of the last minute as you look to the future, what's important in terms of the workforce, work environment? I think what's really important, and we're seeing this across literature, is really to look at the people we're working with as a kind of partnership in an ecosystem, which means we have to listen to one another. We have to hear what our employees want. We have to hear what our employers need. We have to figure out how do we best meet needs, not just for now, but for the long term. Um, so I think now is a time of unprecedented power in many, many decades for employees. We need to figure out in partnership how to negotiate a better future for all of us. Well said indeed. So much we could hit, but that's all the time we have. I certainly want to thank my guest, Dr. Eli Jamison, professor of practice in the Department of Management and the Pampling College of Business at Virginia Tech. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you will do so for the next conversation with Bob Denton.